keeps you up at night? The thought of dying a painful, protracted death? Me too. I blame the state of our nation's health care. And even though we're supposedly all covered, we can keep our doctors and everything's fine now. It's obvious we're still in a state of flux. And that's putting it kindly. Patients are getting hammered with taxes and uncertainty. Doctors have to answer to an even more centralized bureaucracy and insurance companies are somehow being subsidized. It's enough to make you wake up in a cold sweat. Healthcare on life support? Someone's got to fix the sick system. We'll have some doctors to poke around inside over the next hour, including Dr. Ron Paul. This is The Independence. Hey there, I'm Kennedy, along with Reason Magazine Editor-in-Chief Matt Welch and Camille Foster from Free Think Media. We are the independents. Mm -mm -mm. We reject both major political parties. We have our own ideas about health care and everything else. And it seems only right to have one of the greatest human beings who knows not only the inside of medicine, but also the inside of the body politic. Our first guest is Dr. Ron Paul. Uh, Dr. Paul, welcome back to The Independence. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Excellent. So let me ask you, I, I want to I take it back in history. What made you want to become a doctor? Very interesting. When I was young, I was aware of World War II, and especially Korea. It bothered me. I became very strongly anti-war, and I was convinced in my own mind that I would ever, never be able to pick up a rifle and shoot somebody else. And uh, for that reason, I thought I anticipated, even as a young person, that there would be a draft. There was a draft in World War II, Korea and Vietnam. And I thought, well, if I get drafted, I will not use a rifle. I thought, well, I could stand the thought of taking care of people. And that was a strong motivation. I was good in science, so it came together. And I made the decision that being a physician made a lot more sense to me than uh, being vulnerable to the government. So you know that even then, I have a resistance to what the government was telling me what to do, and I certainly have resisted what the government wanted to tell me what to do in my practice of medicine. All right, so what has gotten us to the point where we now have Obamacare? How did health care get so bad that people thought the only solution was a new massive entitlement? Well, it's all it's always that one thing. Uh, there's always benefits. People like to get a free lunch, so they're teased with saying, uh, you know, you can keep everything uh, uh, that you have, but we'll pay your bills for you. And, and uh, a, a British doctor in the 1970s told me once, he said that, uh, and when I asked him, well, why will the doctors go along with this? They won't, they won't go, get into it and let the government uh, get the doctors involved. He says they, the government will stuff their mouths with money. And that's how it really got started in this, you know, with Medicare and Medicaid, because doctors started getting paid for cases that they were doing for charity before that. And uh, before you know it, uh, they were trapped, they were dependent, and it was very hard to get out of the system. I uh, saw that coming, and that is the reason why, when I was still practicing medicine before I went to Congress, that I refused to participate in any of the government programs. Dr. Paul, yeah, you referenced the sort of growth of Medicare and the entitlements and the sort of system of charity hospitals that it supplanted. Did it drive out the private provision of health care, especially uh, health care to people who really couldn't afford it? Did we drive out the private market of health care delivery for poor people in this country? No, I think we made it much worse. I can recall uh, in the early 1960s, shortly after I had a license, I worked in a Catholic hospital, and it was both for training as well as making a couple dollars. And I would work for $3 an hour. And uh, I wasn't much money, but I felt like I was doing something. Nobody was ever turned away. So I never saw the people out on the streets not getting medical care. And uh, it has been the government involvement that has driven up the prices, the inefficiency, and the cost going to the middleman and everybody except the patient benefiting. So it was, it's a total disaster. Central economic planning, no matter what you talk about, and especially in medicine now, it's the worst thing in the world. So if anybody cares about poor people getting medical care or making sure they have a decent living, they have to come around to believing that the government isn't the source of solving those problems. The government 
government creates almost all of these problems, and we have to have a better understanding and a greater trust in how the market works. Today, doctors charge the maximum. Everybody charges the maximum because of third-party uh, payment. And uh, in the old days, everybody charged the minimum, or they would help somebody along. Uh, but today, the cost goes up in the hospitals and the labs and the insurance companies and drug companies. Everybody goes to the maximum because they figure they're going to get a bigger piece of the pie. And that leads, of course, to rationing and controls and, and dictations and telling doctors how to practice medicine. It's a total disaster. Well, well, Dr. Paul, a question I've wanted to ask you in particular for a long time is what are the limits of free market medicine? Uh, obviously, the American American Medical Association has a monopoly on both the minting of new doctors and the establishment of educational institutions for the same doctors. They also establish a lot of the rules that these new doctors are minted under, some of which are, are potentially dangerous. I mean, you have young medical students that are working 40 and 60 hours a week, but I'll stop filibustering and let you answer. D do you think that there is room for other agencies or other organizations to get involved in the process of creating new doctors as well? Yeah. Yeah, we have uh, corporate medicine, and it's state-run, local and national, and licenses are used. Uh, you should uh, get rid of the licensing um, programs. I mean, patients aren't protected because I went and got a license. They should have protection because I went to a good medical school and uh, my patients would tell other uh, potential patients what kind of medicine I practice. But the license doesn't do anything. All that does is exclude the competition. And uh, it should be open. They don't need me to check on a sore throat to give somebody medication uh, that is not necessary. But licensing uh, and the exclusion, matter of fact, the AMA and participation with government in the early part of the 20th century actually closed down hundreds of hospitals that were actually, you know, appealing to minority groups and to women even before that. So the organized medicine closed that down, told them how they should practice medicine, and then, of course, then they had to have affirmative action do these all these other things. You just have to legalize freedom of choice, and you should uh, and this is a tough thing to sell because a lot of people still think that uh, the customer and the patients are protected against unethical behavior because the government requires a license. But all it does is exclude competition, whether it's real estate agents or uh, whether it's plumbers or carpenters or anything else. The license is always there to protect a special interest group. And in medicine, it's very much the same way. What about, uh, what about having a free market for organ donors? I mean, right now, you, you talk about a constrained list and the impossibility for really sick people to get what they need. Should people be allowed to sell their organs? Yeah, absolutely. They should be able to. You know, I, I participated in and sold uh, some of my body uh, in medical school, and I had an incentive and uh, two incentives. I, I wanted to get $35 for a pint of blood, but I also thought I was doing somebody good. And uh, generally speaking, the uh, blood banks were filled. And blood, bone marrow, now they're starting to allow people to pay for it. No, it should be done in the market. It should be done. Uh, uh, ethics can control this. Uh, there can be people you can't take advantage of people, but there would be a lot of things, a lot of improvements can be done if, if families and, and individuals uh, can make those decisions. And, uh, and, and there, there could be, uh, even before death, people could sign permission for this. But uh, I think it should be in the free okay. market and not state regulated because once you get the state involved, you have shortages. And, and now, then how, how are those organs uh, uh, distributed? Sometimes politically, you know, if you're on the inside, you might be able to get the liver transplant or the heart transplant and oh, get yeah. moved up uh, on, on the ladder, or you might have a, uh, you know, a special case and put on political pressure, and all of a sudden they have to capitulate. No, the market could take care of organ transplants, and uh, nothing is perfect, but let me tell you, it would be a lot better than the system that we have today because we have artificial shortages of organ transplants uh, because of the government regulations. All right, one last question. If you were in college today, would you still go to medical school and become a doctor in this current environment? Yeah, I probably would, uh, mainly because uh, overall, you know, I had this incentive to do something in, in medicine. I have three, three of my kids are uh, physicians. I never talked to them about going. I never pressured them to go. I never talked to them out of going. 
Uh, but I always thought they had the same motivation, a similar motivation to practice good medicine. And I also believe that uh, even in spite of all our problems today, if they would just give us the right to opt out, the, the description that was uh, made just a few minutes ago about how Canada finally ruled that a uh, patient could seek medicine outside of the system. And this is why Obamacare is such a threat, because it's trying to make it so you can't go out of the system. But as long as there's that opt-out, the physician and the patients should have a chance. There's a lot of burdens, but what business can you get in today uh, that you don't have to put up with, uh, uh, you know, federal agencies, whether it's EPA or OSHA, land control, FEMA, all these other things. So it's, it's this concept of liberty that is the problem that at this pre present moment. It's affecting medicine more than anything else. But it's the cause of liberty that we should champion, not just free market medicine, because that's one major segment of it, but it's liberty that we should cherish. And we do, and we cherish having you on. You can see more of Dr. Ron Paul on the Ron Paul channel, ronpaulchannel.com. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, coming up, is free market medicine in your future? Will doctors go galt and leave the system? Our health care is on life support, and we're doing surgery. Next. Take it away, Joe. Welcome back to The Independence. Tonight's show is all about the American health care system and why it is on life support. It only seems right to have a couple of doctors on the paddle. And tonight, our bone saws in residence are Dr. Elizabeth Rosenthal. She's a dermatologist, and she's glorious. And Dr. Stephen Reisman. He's director of the New York Cardiac Diagnostic Center. Um, Dr. Reisman, I've, every time I breathe in, it, um, <laughs> it catches. And when I run, my heart beats faster. Is that normal? Yeah, I mean, if you're, depending what, if you're in good shape or not, if you're in good shape, it'll beat less fast. If are you you're, saying fat? I'm saying maybe you need to, uh, <laughs> no, maybe you need to exercise every day. That's oh, all. wow. <laughs> the, the gloves are coming off. <laughs> all right, well, uh, people are not thrilled with Obamacare. The private insurance market is in total chaos, and there is no solid alternative in sight. Here's the president. The nation's largest organizations representing doctors and nurses have embraced our plan. All right, well, doctors I know pretty much hate Obamacare. What have you two found? Um, how will this new health care horizon affect the way you perform medicine? It won't affect the way I perform medicine at all. And I think it's... Why not? A, a it's not going to change anything. You, you don't think it's going to change anything you do? I think more people will have insurance. Okay. That's good. And, and I think the insurance companies will not be able to abuse the patients as badly as they have. But otherwise, it's not going to change. The basic system isn't changing. We're depending still on private health insurance, and we still are going to have millions of people who are uninsured and underinsured. There's going to be fewer uninsured, but there's going to be more underinsured because the insurance that's offered is very skimpy. Sounds like and a bad system. Yeah, I, I, I think it is. Well, doctor, right. do you think that's the number one problem facing our health care system, the fact that some people had, had not traditionally had insurance, certainly under Obamacare, they're supposed to be able to purchase insurance with these subsidies? There, there are so many things wrong with our current health care system. It's hard to say what the worst thing is. But certainly, many, many people in this country just cannot afford health care. They just simply can't afford it. They don't go to the doctor when they need to because they can't afford it. Is this a prescription to fix health care? And how will Obamacare affect the way you you perform medicine? I think Obamacare will uh, affect the way myself and many physicians uh, practice medicine. Um, I think the problem is that a lot of these new health plans, although the premiums are low, the deductibles are very high, and it'll dissuade patients from coming to see the doctor if they have a $5,000 deductible. I think it's a real disaster. I mean, I think it's, it's not the way to go, and I think it's going to hurt the practice of medicine because many people who used to be in a, a better coverage plan are now going to be on a plan that really requires them to pay out of pocket before insurance covers them. And a lot of them don't even realize what's deductible, what is coinsurance, what's copay, and how all these changes are going to affect their going to the doctor. So oh. I think it's a big problem. Oh, it, Isn't sounds like, uh, it sounds like bureaucracy. We're going to switch gears yeah. just a little bit. The question still remains, what is the role of government in health care, and is that totally necessary? Here again is the president. If you have health insurance, the reform we're proposing will provide you with more security and more stability. It will keep government out of health care decisions, giving you the option to keep your insurance if you're happy with it. That is malarkey. 
nonsense. I had a great insurance plan. I lost it. And far ahead of the January 1st deadline, when I lost my insurance, I signed up for insurance. But because the government has thrown health care into such total chaos, consumers like me have no way of reaching the insurance company to find out if we're actually covered. My son had exactly the same problem as you. He had insurance, and he lost it from Obamacare, and now he had a lot of trouble. All three of my sons had a lot of trouble signing yeah, up. Yeah, we don't even know. Insurance. So what role, I mean, the government has obviously screwed okay. up the system that the maybe was broken, but at least it was working, and now we have no idea. Well, first of all, most of the people that this happened to, it's a small percentage of the, of the total population. I agree with Dr. Weissman that, Reisman that Obamacare is not solving the problem, but I don't think it's because of the government. To me, we have to get rid of the private health insurance industry, which takes profit, makes profit the main purpose. And the only way you can make profit with health insurance is to not deliver care, to avoid sick people, and to only cover but that's healthy not, people. But that's not the problem that we actually see. What we actually see, a number of studies have indicated that we actually are over caring for people, that there's about a third of all of the spending in the health care industry is actually going to procedures that don't make people any yes, healthier. We've also seen that there isn't necessarily a, co a clear correlation between having health insurance, per se, and actually being healthy, as strange as that might sound. In which case, if we're talking about prices and we're talking about access to care, then mandating that people have insurance or simply trying to get private insurance providers out of the system doesn't actually seem like a solution to the problem that, that both of you have raised, that well, it's still way too expensive to see a doctor. And I'd agree with you, okay. but I don't know yeah, that and we And cheap insurance problem. has made it far more expensive. Insurance is a whole extra layer of, of expense that we don't need. To, to go along with this thought, I believe there is truly a medical industrial complex in this country. It used I to be agree. the military industrial complex. Right. We have pharmaceutical companies. Look at all the commercials and all the money go that they are spending right. and making. Look at the hospitals, how much they're charging for a Q-tip. Look at the insurance companies that are taking 20% of every dollar right. out of the health care system. So, so doctors are getting hosed as much as consumers. Total, doctors Absolutely. are getting hosed as much, and doctors are in the middle. They have a new... Well, then it does affect you, because Obamacare isn't fixing any of that. I mean, so when I ask you if Obamacare is, is affecting the way you do medicine, obviously Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. I believe it is. All right, is. okay, we, we have more to get to. Next, if there's a balance to be had between the government and health care, there's an even trickier one when it comes to reproduction, birth control, birth, and the business of preventing and making babies in the age of Obama. Obamacare. That's next. Make sure the younger people do sign up. The Obama administration is rolling out a new ad campaign that's targeted specifically at the young and vibrant. Hi, I'm Alex, and this is my wife, Martha. And we're both approaching the big 6-0. And we have health care issues to deal with. It's not cheap. But fortunately, we don't have to pay for it. No, you do. That's right. You young people are paying for our drugs and our doctors. Not to mention our Social Security and our Medicare when we retire to Boca. And you know why? Because you don't vote. And we do. That's right. Hope you enjoy that Burning Guy Festival. The Affordable Care Act. Next time, maybe pick up a newspaper. <laughs> I love it. Or tune into the independence. Where, if you're making babies, we are not the ones to stand in the way of your horizontal mambo. Having said that, the debate over the contraception mandate pits nuns against the state. Obviously, sisters are doing it for themselves, and they don't need outside government influence. But what about the rest of us broads? Is birth control a universal right? If so, if we are so hell-bent on preventing babies, how are we going to halt the slide of depopulation? It is such a good question, and we're going to ask our doctors because health care is on life support. Dr. Matt Welch. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, I think that I'm totally in favor of contraception, uh, by the way. I think uh, everyone uh, should use it. Oh, because um, we were on the fence. We, yeah, we yeah, really yeah, thought yeah. that maybe you just were the wanna, guy that... just want to clear that up right away. Um, what makes all this interesting is when the government gets involved in health care, an intimate decision making here, you have two sides of a coin. One is the contraception, and so you have a lot of Democrats and supporters of Obamacare saying, of course, this has to be provided for free or cheap uh, for everybody. But then you have, let's say, Republican Governor uh, Bob McDonnell in, in Virginia, who for a while, a year and a half ago, was saying that if anyone was going to have an abortion, they need to have a transvaginal exam. Um, that's the a point personal. is, it's a little personal. But the point is, when when you put politicians in a position to affect intimate decisions, either way, you're going to offend someone's values, and that's what interests me about the whole debate. All right. So, is it a public good or a personal choice? Should the government should the government pay, pay, for, pay, for, it? pay yes, for it? Yes, it's part of health care. So I think the government should pay for health care. I mean, there, I could say a lot of things are part of health care. I could say my my deep conditioner that makes no, my no, that's ends not. Look I'm talking about necessary health care, something that you 
is necessary. Well, I'm not it's, talking it's about hair transplants to, and dermabrasion. It's necessary for me to have cross-training as no. part of my fitness regime, no. so the government should pay for my treadmill no. and well, my $10,000 bicycle. The point is, Absolutely. on some of these cases, is that people who actually don't need to have it uh, are being asked to pay for it as part of a cross-subsidy regime, right. and is that uh, a good idea? And then people who find that it uh, offends their religious sensibilities don't want to have to pay for it. Should okay. they have to be paid for it? Is, well, isn't that an act I, of I've, religious conscience? Yeah, if two-thirds of your life you don't need birth control, why should you have to pay for it all of your working life? Because we're all in it together, and I think that there are certain things that are social needs, and if you spread the cost around everybody, it's the, it's the best, fairest, and most efficient way to do it. Well, birth control is really not that expensive. If you were in an accident and you became paralyzed for life, and we had, we had medicine that had, you know, taxes that paid for, for medical care, why should I, you know, pay for your accident because you were so care careless to have an accident and become paralyzed? You I mean, were so heartless. Dr. I don't Reisman. believe that. <laughs> do I you think, think I should pay Okay, I'm going to ask him. Way. Dr. Reisman, do you think that birth control should be allowed over the counter? Um, I think birth control should be allowed, uh, you know, freely, that people who want it and need it can, can have access to it. I think it's, and to answer I the mean, question. I mean, why is it still only available by prescription? Well, you know, like with many medications, you have to really make sure there are no risk factors for developing complications. There are complications with every medicine. There are complications with aspirin. There, and that's why you should seek advice before you take aspirin, because if you have really? a bleeding tendency, yeah, if you have a bleed, if you're an older person and you have certain bleeding tendencies, and it's full, still over the counter. But the, yeah, there's a distinction between seeking advice and actually right. having a prescription in order to get it. And you're you're trusted, you're responsible enough to take Tylenol on your own, Matt. I trust you. I don't trust you. I <laughs> walked into CVS the other day and I said, I deserve condoms. Give them to me now. You know what they told me? I need a bag of Rex. All right. Imagine a world where health care is so restrictive. Even the best doctors throw up their hands and leave the system for private practice and greener pastures. Is that time now? Are we seeing a mass exodus in medicine? That discussion is vital and we'll have it. Stat. Oh, Nancy, can't we stop, look and listen before we cross the street into the brave new world of health care? We have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Welcome back to The Independence, where I'm going to pretend I didn't just hear that Matt Welch, okay? <laughs> and you don't even need to know what he said because it's filthy. We are taking the temperature of health care here. It's got a fever, and it needs a hell of a lot more than cowbell. Dr. Jeff Singer is a practicing surgeon and Cato scholar. He has written extensively about the state of medicine and even concludes many docs will go galt. What does this mean for the future of healthcare? Dr. Singer, welcome to the Independence. Thank you for having me here. Um, well, actually, the trend is, has been going on for a while. You know, they say who, he who pays the piper calls the tune, and not right now. The government pays for roughly half the healthcare in this country. We, through Medicare and Medicaid, and now with Obamacare and the government subsidizing a lot of the health insurance for people that aren't on Medicare and Medicaid, the government's paying more. So for the last several years, they've been trying to control the way doctors and hospitals practice medicine uh, in, an, in the interest of saving them money. It's only understandable. But the thing is that they think that people are sort of like machines. So, you know, I can understand if I was the Maytag repairman, I was given, a, you know, a, uh, an instruction manual to follow and I was trained to f go out and fix washing machines and they all, so you got to follow the same set of uh, instructions. But when you're dealing with people, there's lots of variability, there's lots of different responses to treatment and a lot of different opinions about how to treat patients. I, I know that, that you've written about this. Is it creating a black market? I mean, you say that's what happens in other centralized healthcare systems all over the world. Is that going to happen in the United States and has that already happened? What does that mean for the average health consumer? Yeah, well, that particular thing is, is not creating a black market. That's just making a lot of doctors want to retire earlier or, or, or quit work or sell their practices and become employees, which is slowing down the delivery of care and making uh, people do, do a lot of waiting and uh, getting a lot of delayed care. What's creating a black market is, is that this also uh, continues to increase the cost of health care. And so more and more doctors are basically dropping out, saying, I'm not playing the game. I'm going to practice according to my own rules. And if that means that I won't take any insurance because I have to follow rules if I do, then fine. I won't take any insurance. I'll just do a cash-only 
uh, medical practice and I'll practice my way. And what's happening is more and more patients are getting disgusted with the the personalization of healthcare, the being treated like cattle, the long waits. And so a lot of them are now seeking out direct, what we call direct care, where a patient is directly paying for health care from a, a provider. If that is to catch on, is there any concern that the government might actually interfere in this growing, developing market? There's always a concern, you know, if it starts to take off. Even in Canada today, uh, a 2005 Supreme Court decision in Canada basically said you can't stop Canadians from seeking to get health care using their own money outside of the Canadian health care system, and you can't stop doctors from providing. You can't punish them. So they sort of decriminalized private care in Canada, and more and more Canadians are finding it rather than having to come south of the border to the United States. So what, what I predict is going to happen as more and more doctors drop out of the system because they, they can't afford to be in the system and they don't, they're not getting so they're professional still going gratification. To be, so they're, they're still going to practice medicine. They're just not going to go through traditional insurance channels. And right, it's going to really be patient-oriented, consumer-oriented medicine because they're now no longer having to please an insurance company or a, a government regulator. Instead, they're having to please the patient. So there's going to be more accountability. They're going to have to answer questions. They're going to have to give satisfactory uh, care to the patient. And if the patient's not satisfied with the answers they're, they're getting, then they'll go elsewhere. And I think more and more doctors are going to uh, we're already seeing that. They're deciding, I like that. I like feeling like a doctor again, where I'm giving direct service to my patient and not following orders from some regulator and some third party uh, administrator. So, what and, you're saying, Dr. And, Jeff, is that uh, Obamacare is the best thing that's ever happened, right? We're creating, we're finally creating well, a free market in medicine. <laughs> you know, and, and ironically, it may turn out to be because the, the Obamacare business model is not workable. I think it's, it's understood it's not going to work. The question is when it's going to collapse, not if it's going to collapse. And when it does collapse, there, there's a, a, for people who are discerning, there's a great lesson to be learned because we, we're basically the, the main driver of all our health care cost problems, which leads to access problems, is the third-party payment system. When there's a third-party payment system, whether it's the government or an insurance company, Speaking that payment results systems, in higher we, costs. We've we got to pay some bills, baby. But uh, Dr. Jeff Singer, thank you very much. I like reading your work. I like your ideas. I thank like you. you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I like You're you, welcome. too. Thank you very much. It's a great show. It's a great day. Up next, is free market medicine the ultimate prescription for a failing healthcare system? We've just had a taste of it, and I actually visited one place I call the future. We have to provide excellent quality service to be competitive. Otherwise, it's not a matter of being competitive. It's a matter of being alive. If you refuse to sign up for an exchange, you're flush with cash and you know exactly what you want from your doctor, your demand might be the future of medicine. Have you heard of LASIK? It works. But the model might be more than meets the eyes. Take a look. LASIK eye surgeon Dr. Ken Modell avoids the red tape and bewildering requirements of the third-party insurance regime as a means of providing quality care. We have to provide excellent quality service to be competitive. Otherwise, it's not a matter of being competitive, it's a matter of being alive if you don't deliver an excellent service. Because our patients who are self-paying in the free market, they don't want to wait an hour to see your doctor. <laughs> they want to make an appointment, be seen quickly. What are the benefits for not having to go through insurance companies? Well, the logistics of getting approvals and pre-approvals by insurance companies, the enormous amount of paperwork that's required before and after. Uh, most practices have whole sections just to deal with insurance companies and preoperative and postoperative clearance and reimbursements. That's entirely avoided to us and we can concentrate on delivering a better, use that effort and manpower to deliver better, you know, personalized experience to the person. Dr. Modell uses the resources not squandered by arcane insurance requirements to stay competitive in the open market and maintain the highest technological standards in an ever-evolving medical field. By being in the free market, you know, we have to provide the best technology to be competitive. The patients are quite savvy, so if it's not the advanced femtosecond laser, they're going to leave. So they know it's, it's a Google away. Good afternoon, New York Eye Specialists. We have a doctor available 24-7. Uh, we can answer calls till 10 p.m. We have to be great to be competitive. 
All right, LASIK operates outside of insurance. People have the procedure every day. And some creative healthcare providers have found a way of offering services to smart and willing consumers that uh, does work outside traditional insurance parameters. Dr. Keith Smith runs a surgery center in Oklahoma, which is okay, where he posts a menu of services and prices, and you don't need to whip out your insurance card. Free market healthcare, Dr. Smith, welcome. Tell me how it works. Well, we, uh, we hardly deal with any insurance companies at all. We still file claims for patients as a courtesy, but we found, found exactly what the LASIK surgeon said, that if we take the manpower and dedicate it to patient care and not deal with all the paperwork and the hassles and even the denials after you go through all those processes, it just, it may, it just makes a lot more sense and it allows us as physicians to deal directly with patients about what care they'll receive and the appropriateness of that and there's no insurance or government bureaucrat in the exam room telling us how to practice medicine. And All right, so question, um, what services do you offer? What, what are typical services look like? And is it just for rich people? <laughs> uh, most of the patients that take advantage of our internet pricing are patients that have been run off by the big hospitals by their pricing. Our, our prices are about a tenth of what the typical so-called not-for-profit hospital charges for the same thing. We offer almost every surgical subspecialty uh, in our facility. And by making this move, we've attracted others here in Oklahoma City to follow follow us. So we have, you know, open heart surgery can be uh, obtained in Oklahoma City at a facility that has outcomes that are as good as any of the facilities in the United States. Um, total joint replacement, cancer therapy, and even a full service hospital has joined us in this effort. So there, there's very little that cannot be obtained in the Oklahoma City area in a, in a free market where we're willing to compete and you know, I've got my prices online and if somebody matches our prices, I'm going to respond to that, and that uh, just like anybody would in any other industry. And that online tri tri price transparency, as you mentioned, I mean, that really is revolutionary for the healthcare industry, but I wonder about transparency in other areas. You talked about medical outcomes in terms of letting your customers know about the quality of care. I mean, when I go on vacation, I can go on TripAdvisor and check out this hotel there aren't really mechanisms like that in healthcare. What sort of information are you giving prospective customers? We've uh, we put our infection rates online. Uh, there are very few indices of quality that can actually be followed scientifically, I believe, because that can be gamed very easily. For instance, if you have an unethical surgeon who's operating on people unnecessarily, his outcomes are going to be great because there's nothing wrong with them in the first place. Uh, so it's just very hard to look at outcomes. Uh, Marty Macri at Hopkins wrote a, a book on outcome transparency where he made the case that the best way to measure it is to do a survey of the employees working at a facility and see if they would have their surgery there. Hmm. So I think you have to be very careful with outcomes. Uh, in Obamacare, the outcomes-based pay is basically a rationing tool so that the very sick, complicated patient with many comorbidities it's very, very unlikely to uh, darken the door of a doctor's office because he knows he's going to be profiled based on their outcome. Oh, so yeah. you, have to be very care you have to be very careful with the outcomes. It's brutal. And that term, comorbidities, it scares the bejesus out of me. Dr. Smith, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Up next, one cancer surgeon breaks down the big fight in the age of government-run health care. Can we find a cure or has Obamacare somehow set us back? That's next on The Independence. This is The Independence, where we're taking a swing at fixing the health care problems in this country because, frankly, medicine is starting to suck. My friend, Dr. Nick Nissen, is one of the most badass liver surgeons in the country. He works on that pesky pancreas, too. And it was a conversation with him that led to this show. He works at Cedar sinai Medical Center in L.A. He's a man with a vision. Obviously, Obamacare changes the scope of how you treat people, Dr. Nissen, and you've had to do some soul searching. What have you found, and how does it change the way you operate? It really does it. You know, we're we're in the trenches, uh, slugging it out with some really difficult diseases. You know, pancreas and liver cancer, and um, you know these are these are these are really challenging on multiple levels. They're challenging for patients uh, to handle emotionally and psychologically, and they're terribly difficult to manage medically. We're not really caught up right now. In, in, in some of the minutiae that, that, I, that I hear discussed uh, regarding, uh, regarding some of this 
uh, these matters. We're really stuck with trying to figure out how cancer works and how it kills you and how we can how we can win that fight. Are you any closer to that? I mean, from, from the time you graduated medical school until now, what kind of technological advancements have you seen in the fight against cancer, specifically liver and pancreatic cancer that you see every day that That's, kills it's, people? It's, absol it's absolutely remarkable. I mean, we have we have an armamentarium today that we we never had even when I came out of out of out of training even when I started my my, my practice at Cedar Sinai 12 years ago we have ways to treat cancers in the liver we never would have dreamed of we can treat we can treat the liver repeatedly we can make the liver grow in ways that allow us to resect tumors that we couldn't previously resect uh, we can offer transplant for some very very difficult scenarios we can treat cancers of the pancreas that were never resectable before and we can do that on patients that were never considered surgical candidates before you know which is really a credit to healthcare and healthcare providers starting from literally starting from the the nursing staff, the volunteers, all the way up to anesthesia and our, 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 our specialty colleagues in GI medicine and radiology. You know, it's the whole spectrum of care that, that really allows us to, to fight. And I think we're fighting much better uh, with better survival, uh, better outcomes. And, and I do think that we're, we're starting to slowly win the fight against these tough cancers. Can you talk a little bit about how the genetic revolution, the sort of molecular revolution of diagnosis has uh, impacted things and where it's going in the future in, in some of these fights. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's probably the way to think about cancer. We sometimes think about it as a disease and have we, have we beat cancer yet? But we're finding out it's heterogeneous and it's insidious and we need every, every clue and every advantage we can get. Some of, the, uh, some of the genetics of cancer have led to new therapies that, for example, may allow chemotherapy to, to penetrate into a tumor better or may allow us to screen better, may allow us to do prophylactic surgeries to even prevent the development of cancer. So, so clearly, um, the genetic analysis and, and that field is terribly important in, in fighting the cancers at the level of detecting cancers, at the level of figuring out which treatment to use, and even ultimately at the level of making drugs work better. And, and what are you most excited about as you look forward into the future of healthcare? What, what's on the horizon that you think is really going to transform medicine? Well, I think the, 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 the two, two things. The first I would say is the ability to target cancers more specifically, to look at the, the, the defenses that they have that have prevented us from really, really getting in there with chemotherapy or even with surgery. And I think as we, as we understand that better and as we develop drugs and, and uh, other therapies to break that down, that's going to help tremendously with cancer fighting. And the second area, you know, I am a surgeon by trade, and the second area I think is the, the evolving uh, ability of surgeons with all of our, our colleagues in these other fields to fight tumors surgically by removing them in ways that we never could before, whether it's through uh, blood vessel reconstruction, whether it's through liver transplant in the case of some liver tumors, and I think that's going to continue to evolve. And, and it's really going to be a marriage of the two fields. The targeted therapies looking at the molecular aspects of the tumors and the, the local regional therapies as we call them, which, which involve removing and eradicating and, 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 and surgically getting rid of these tumors. And th those fields have to work together in a lot of cancers for us to really have good outcomes, and that's going to continue to improve. Do you think we'll find a cure within the next to 10 years for what we call cancer? No. No, we won't. But we're, but we're making progress. We're making progress almost month by month. I mean, we have new drugs for pancreatic cancer now that we didn't have even two years ago. We have new treatments that, that literally, like I said, five years ago were, were imaginary. So we're, we're making huge strides, but we need, we need an awful lot of help. All right, Dr. Nissen, thank you so much for joining us. Very thank good. You. I'm optimistic about the future. I'm on drugs. And Matt Welch's wife is my drug mule. That story and more as we wrap up healthcare on life support. This is the Independence. She goes running for the shelter of her mother's little helper, and it helps her, I know. Welcome back to the Independence, where for us, medicine is not a hobby, it's a calling. I have a stupid stomach condition that requires a pretty basic drug that is banned by the FDA in this country because at the FDA there are a bunch of arbitrary knobs. I cannot get my pills here. I either have to order them from an online pharmacy in Great Britain or Matt Welch's wife when she goes to France because she's French, she gets them for me and I trade her skincare for drugs. 
and it's, so far it's working quite well, but it's so ridiculous that I cannot get my motility drugs in this country because the FDA has decided that one group of people might be harmed through the IV method of this drug's transmission, which I don't, I, I don't have an IV, I take a pill. France is like the, the mirror image of America in many ways in the healthcare system. Like Because we have two first ladies, Oprah and Michelle Obama. <laughs> I'm not going to go there exactly, uh, but no, they take the two countries that pop the most pills in the in the world are France and the United States. Really? Uh, yeah. I thought they were a bunch of... No, 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 they're all, they're swimming. very super uh, anxious and they're all, because no one can get a job and all that kind of stuff, but they, compared to us, unleash their pharmacists. You do a lot of business at the local pharmacy, like you can cut out the, the middleman, you don't need to get That's a the doctor. They respect to get the pharmacist. A, they, and the pharmacist respects you and you can use them as a drug mule. I, my wife will point <laughs> out that it's not, you're not free riding off the uh, off No, the I French have a taxpayer. prescription, I do. And, you're paying and the full price yeah. according to what they think the full price is, which is is a little, probably a little bit different than what Americans uh, think the full price is. I go, I've been using French healthcare for 16 years or, or uh, uh, thereabouts, and I prefer it as a consumer by far to the American healthcare system. You are such a commie. Uh, because I'm such a commie. No, because I couldn't get health insurance in this country. For I was a healthy young person, and I just wanted to make sure uh, I, you know, I wouldn't bankrupt my wife if I got hit by a car, and they wouldn't ever give me health insurance here. It was infuriating to me as a freelancer living in LA, living the dream mm. uh, that you couldn't get insurance, whereas you go to France and you say, I'd like a checkup, and you go, you see a doctor that day, you pay out of pocket, and you're done. So yes, it's way too expensive, but as a consumer and consumer-oriented uh, healthcare, in some ways, French socialist healthcare is better than America quasi-capitalist healthcare. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, we talk a lot. I mean, there's a lot that's wrong with our current healthcare system. There are between two and 400,000 people a year who are apparently dying as a result of preventable medical injuries. That is the third or fourth leading cause of death, mm. which is really astronomical. The, the, the Hippocratic Oath says, first do no harm, and that is not what our healthcare system is doing. This now. is infections in hospitals. Infections in hospitals and preventable medical injuries, which I had a loved one uh, who very nearly became one of those statistics. Uh, who so it's who very contracted an infection in a hospital yeah. through a procedure unrelated to that body part. After botched procedures. So yeah. it, was a, it was a concatenation of, of, of incidences there or offenses. No, oh, Camille, my thoughts are with your family. Keep drinking red wine. And thank you, Emmanuel, for getting me drugs. All right, girl? <laughs> it's all right. Don't even worry, my friend. Though healthcare may be in a health crisis, we will find a way to fix you. Whether you go galt with a group of rogue docs, have an uninsured surgery, or give in and go full commie, there's always a way out. It's an unfolding story, probably not as drastic as the alarmists would have you believe. And I have faith in the good people and the good doctors who still practice medicine for all the right reasons. Our goal is to keep the government at bay so we can all play doctor on our own terms. It's kinky and I like it. For Matt Welch and Camille Foster, I'm Kennedy. Good night.